Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing uh, the drug treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, so we've now finished our discussion of the pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis, and we want to now start discussing drugs that can actually be used to treat uh, rheumatoid arthritis and prevent the pathology. Okay, right, so we're going to start off by uh, discussing uh, the NZ drugs. Okay, so the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which work by uh, blocking or inhibiting the enzymes uh, cyclooxygenases, okay, uh, which, of which there are two main ones, which we'll discuss in a moment. So the NZ stands for the non-steroidal, so N is for non, uh, S is for steroidal, and then A is for anti, I is for inflammatory, Drugs. So the NZs are the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Okay, and these are going to be COX inhibitors. Right, so how are these going to work? Well, basically they're going to block the uh, inflammatory response from occurring. So remember, a key part of rheumatoid arthritis is that you have this chronic inflammatory response occurring. So you're continuously um, allowing... Um, fluid from the blood to leave the bloodstream and go into the synovium and into the synovial fluid. You're bringing in leukocytes continuously and of course you have your uh, blood vessels, your terminal arterioles which lead to the capillary beds which supply the synovium. Those are continuously dilatated. Okay, so NZs are going to work by stopping or at least reducing the inflammatory response and thereby in reducing the inflammation within the joint. And if you reduce the inflammation, then you may also help to uh, reduce the uh, adaptive immune response, which is obviously uh, perpetuating the uh, acute inflammation uh, because of um, it producing more antibodies against a greater range of citrullinated uh, protein autoantigens within the synovium, and also uh, it, the adaptive immune response is attacking the bone by producing these T helper 17 cells, which are producing cytokines, which trigger uh, the um, uh, release of further uh, mediators, uh, namely this macrophage colony stimulating factor and this rank. L, okay, which then cause the differentiation of monocytes into osteoclasts. So basically, these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are going to work by reducing the inflammatory response, okay, and therefore reducing the synovitis that you're going to get. Okay, so let's discuss um, the um, acute inflammatory response. Specifically, we're going to discuss how type 1 and type 2 activation of endothelial cells are going to uh, produce vasodilatation of the terminal arterioles, because that's the main way that these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are going to work. They're going to stop the production of one of the molecules that uh, causes the vasodilatation of the terminal arterioles, and thereby they will stop the increased blood flow to the synovium, and thereby they will hugely reduce the amount of inflammatory exudate you're going to produce, and also the number of leukocytes you're going to uh, be able to recruit, because if fewer leukocytes are uh, getting to the site, and also fewer, uh, if less fluid is uh, moving through the synovium, then the amount of inflammatory exudate you can produce and the amount of leukocytes you can recruit is going to go down. So, remember we talked about these um, pro-inflammatory mediators such as histamine, interleukin-1, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. Okay, so remember interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha were released by um, macrophages, dendritic cells, as well as the T-helper-17 cells. And then we had histamine, which was released by mast cells. And then we also had bradykinin and calidin, which were being formed uh, from the uh, calocrine kinin system. Okay, and basically these act on endothelial cells. So histamine and bradykinin and calidin, they all produce uh, what's known as type 1 activation of endothelial cells. Okay, so these are going to result in type 1 activation. And interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha are going to uh, cause what's known as type 2 activation. Okay, so type 2 activation. 
Right, so let's see how type 1 and type 2 activation of endothelial cells is going to result in uh, the vasodilatation of the terminal arterioles. So basically, let's start with type 1 activation, because type 1 activation happens quicker, and type 2 activation really just um, increases the type 1 activation response. It really just does everything type 1 activation does, but it does it better than type 1 activation. Okay, so let's start with type 1 activation. So in type 1 activation, what's going to happen is that calcium level within the endothelial cell is going to go up. So you're going to get a rise in intracellular calcium within the endothelial cell. Okay. So let's show this happening here. So here is our endothelial cell, and calcium within the cytoplasm of the endothelial cell is going to go up. And this is achieved via a GQ pathway. So the receptors for histamine, bradykinin, and calidin, they're all linked to the GQ uh, heterotrimeric G protein, which then leads to the release of intracellular calcium stores. Now, basically, calcium is going to bind to a C2 domain on an enzyme known as cellular phospholipase A2. So let me put this enzyme here. So cellular phospholipase A2 is often denoted by CPLA2, like so. So this stands for cellular phospholipase, that's the PL, and then A2. So, cellular phospholipase A2 is usually within the cytoplasm of the cell, okay? So, it's nowhere near the cell membrane, it's in the cytoplasm. However, it has a special domain, okay, which I'll draw here, which is known as a C2 domain, which is just a certain structure that proteins can contain. And basically, uh, calcium combines to this C2 domain, multiple calciums combine to this C2 domain, and when calcium binds to that C2 domain, it causes the cellular phospholipase A2 to then translocate from the cytoplasm to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. So what's going to happen is the enzyme is going to go up to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer, which means the inner layer of phospholipids that makes up the phospholipid bilayer. So it's going to come and sit just underneath the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. And once it gets there, it's going to start working on a component uh, of the phospholipid bilayer. So it's going to work on a substrate which is within the phospholipid bilayer. So let me show you the structure of this substrate. Okay, so uh, if we have the phospholipid bilayer here, there is a molecule in this known as phosphatidylcholine, okay, and this is the substrate for this enzyme, cellular phospholipase A2, so phosphatidylcholine, and I want to just draw you a cartoon of the structure of phosphatidylcholine, don't worry, I won't draw the full molecular structure out, but I'm going to draw you a cartoon of it, and by the way, phosphatidylcholine is often abbreviated as PC, and the reason I'm going to show you this cartoon is because I want to emphasize that phosphatidylcholine is really just a modified phospholipid, and really the best way to do that is show you it uh, with a little picture. Okay, so let's start off with the structure, uh, or at least a cartoon, of the structure of a boring old phospholipid. So a normal phospholipid consists of a glycerol molecule, which is this horizontal line here, uh, which then has three alcohol groups, and to the first two alcohol groups you esterify long-chain carboxylic acids, which I'll uh, highlight here in orange. Okay, so in orange these are um, the long-chain carboxylic acids, which have been esterified uh, to the uh, first and second alcohol groups of the glycerol molecule. So this is a long-chain uh, carboxylic acid. Okay, and we've got two of them. Uh, Long-chain carboxylic acids are also sometimes referred to as fatty acids, so that's a, another phrase that you might see used for these. Okay. Uh, so you have two fatty acids esterified to the first and second alcohol groups of the glycerol molecule. And the glycerol molecule is this horizontal whoops, this horizontal line which I've now coloured in green. So this is glycerol. Okay, and uh, glycerol is the biochemist name for a molecule that chemists would call a uh, propane one two three trial. And although propane one two three trial is a complete mouthful, 
Uh, it's useful in that it tells you exactly what the structure of this molecule is. It's a free carbon molecule where you have alcohol groups coming off the first carbon, the second carbon, and the third carbon. Okay, and to the first two alcohol groups, you have a stereified long chain carboxylic acids. We've already agreed that. And then to this final alcohol group, the third one over here, you have then uh, added on a phosphate group. So this in purple, this purple ball here, this represents a phosphate group. Okay, and you've linked the phosphate group to the third alcohol group of the glycerol molecule via a phosphoester link. Now, uh, this phosphate group has another alcohol group. So let me just show you the structure of a phosphate group. So a phosphate group looks like this. It has a phosphorus atom at the center. And then the phosphorus atom has a, a double bond to an oxygen up here. And then it has two alcohol groups coming off it here and here. And then it also has a single bond to another oxygen, which has acquired a further electron via ionic means and therefore has a negative charge on. So, basically, you can see that this group here, where you have the phosphorus atom double bonded to an oxygen and then with an alcohol group on, this is very similar to a carboxylic acid group, except for the fact that that is a phosphorus atom rather than a carbon atom. So, basically, it can link onto alcohol groups on the glycerol molecule in pretty much exactly the same way as you link carboxylic acid groups to alcohol groups, except this time, instead of being called an ester link, it's called a phosphoester link. Now, there's still a free alcohol group on this phosphorus group, what, sorry, this phosphate group, once it's esterified via a phosphoester link to that alcohol group of the glycerol molecule. And this can form another phosphoester link with another alcohol molecule off here. And that's what's going to happen. This is the structure of a normal old boring old phospholipid. To convert it into phosphatid alcoline, you're going to stick on another alcohol group off here. And I should just add that the other name for a boring old phospholipid is a phosphatidate molecule. So that is the logic in this name, basically. Okay, so you will never ever hear someone refer to a phospholipid, a boring old phospholipid like this, as a phosphatidate molecule. But when we're talking about modified phospholipids, when we're talking about uh, these phospholipids that have had things stuck onto them, you use phosphatidyl all the time, basically. So, for instance, PIP2, phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate. It's the same sort of thing. It's just a uh, normal old boring old phospholipid with a bit stuck off it, the inositol and then two phosphate groups. Okay, but in the case of phosphatidylcholine, we're going to stick on a choline molecule. Okay, and I'll denote this just by a rectangle that we've stuck on here. Now, this choline that we're sticking on here is the same choline as is a component of acetylcholine, and it's become a horrid blue smudge there. Uh, but I just want to show you its structure, so I will go over the page, or not, I'll get another page. And I'll show you the structure of choline. Okay, so choline needs to have an alcohol group. In order for the phosphate group to be able to form a phosphoester link, it needs an alcohol group. Okay, and the structure of um, uh, choline is as follows. So it's a two-carbon molecule, like so, where you have hydrogens coming off these carbons. Okay, and then you have an alcohol group coming off here. So this is an alcohol group. And then off the other side, you then have a nitrogen, which has three methyl groups coming off it. And of course, nitrogens only have a valency of three. They should not have four groups bound to them. So one of these groups, uh, well, in one of these groups, the nitrogen has provided both electrons, and that causes the nitrogen to have a positive charge. And you might wonder, well, if the nitrogen's provided both electrons into one of these bonds, that surely means that the other uh, and, well, one, the other member of this bond should have a negative charge, surely, if we say it's this bond that the nitrogen has provided both electrons into. But when you forge this bond, uh, the carbon that uh, came in to form this bond with the nitrogen, that will have had a positive charge on it initially, i.e. it will have lost an electron by some ionic means, basically, uh, so it will have been a cation. So it will have come in here, taken, uh, well, 
formed a bond where the nitrogen provided both electrons. And of course, the understanding in a covalent bond is that one electron comes from each member of the species. So as soon as, sorry, each um, member of the bond. Okay, so when the nitrogen gives both electrons, it's as though it's given one to the carbon. And then the carbons use that electron to bind with the other electron that the nitrogen's provided. So effectively, the nitrogen gave an electron away to this carbon. That neutralized this carbon, okay, so it's now neutral. But the nitrogen then gains the positive charge that originally the carbon had. Okay, so this is the structure of codeine. And basically, you're going to use this alcohol group to uh, bind onto the phosphate group to form a uh, phosphoester link, and that's how you're going to create this phosphatidylcholine molecule. And I'm just going to get this piece of paper back again. So, this is the substrate for the cellular phospholipase A2 once it has translocated to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, now what's it going to do to the phosphatidylcholine? Well, basically, it's going to cleave this bond between the second alcohol group of the glycerol molecule and the second long-chain carboxylic acid of the uh, phosphatidylcholine molecule. Okay, so the two products of that, if I show these on this next page, the two products of this cleavage that the cellular phospholipase A2 is going to perform are going to be the rest of the uh, phosphatidylcholine okay so let me get my colors so here in blue we have the uh, choline molecule here okay and that's gone a horrible blue smudge but never mind okay here in purple we have the phosphate group okay here in green we have the glycerol molecule and here in orange, we have the one remaining long chain carboxylic acid. Okay, so the other one has been cleaved off. Now, this is a molecule that is known as lysophosphatidylcholine. Okay, so it's all one word lysophosphatidylcholine. So, one of the products of this cleavage that is performed by the cellular phospholipase A2 is lysophosphatidylcholine. Now, the other product is that you're going to get the long-chain carboxylic acid that you've cleaved off uh, that second alcohol group, okay? So let's show that here. So here is this long-chain carboxylic acid. Now, the question then is, which long-chain carboxylic acid is it? Well, usually in phosphatidylcholine molecules, there is a set uh, long-chain carboxylic acid that is esterified to the second alcohol group of the glycerol molecule in the phosphatidylcholine molecule. Okay, and this is a long-chain carboxylic acid known as arachidonic acid. Okay, and I should just add that both of these products of the uh, cellular phospholipase A2 enzyme are going to remain within the phospholipid bilayer. So everything is still happening within the phospholipid bilayer. Both of them are still uh, in the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, now, basically... The cyclooxygenase enzymes are going to work now on this arachidonic acid. Okay, so to summarize what we've done so far, when you activated your endothelial cells with histamine or bradykinin slash calidin, okay, uh, you caused calcium to go up in the cytoplasm of the endothelial cell. That activated the cellular phospholipase A2. It translocated from the cytoplasm to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer, and then started breaking down the phosphatidylcholine molecules into lysophosphatidylcholine and arachidonic acid. Now, there is an enzyme which is constitutively present within the membrane of the uh, endothelial cells, okay? And this is called cyclooxygenase 1. Okay, so I'll put this here. So it's a great big enzyme that is implanted into the phospholipid bilayer. And it's called cyclooxygenase 1, and it's often abbreviated to COX-1. So this stands for cyclo... Um, and then sometimes people put a dash, sometimes people uh, um, leave out the dash. Okay, so cyclooxygenase 1 or COX-1 for short, so C is for cyclo, OX is for oxygenase, and then 1. Okay, so COX-1, now it is constitutively expressed is the important thing. All endothelial cells will have COX-1 in their membranes. Now, 
Arachidonic acid is not usually present within the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so it's only present after you've activated the cellular phospholipase A2, which has started breaking down the phosphatidylcholine to release the arachidonic acid. And what's going to happen is that the cyclooxygenase 1 enzyme is going to work on arachidonic acid. Okay, so what is it going to convert it into? Well, basically, it's going to catalyze two reactions. Okay, so it's firstly going to catalyze the conversion of arachidonic acid into a molecule known as prostaglandin G2. Okay, and prostaglandin G2 is usually abbreviated to PGG2 for short. So this is called prostaglandin, and then usually people put G2 like that. Okay, so that's the abbreviation for prostaglandin G2. And then COX-1 doesn't stop there. It converts it further. It then converts prostaglandin G2 into prostaglandin H2. Okay. And again, PGH2, sorry, prostaglandin H2 is often abbreviated to PGH2 for short. Right. Okay. So these two reactions are so important that they actually have their own names. So, arachidonic acid being converted into prostaglandin G2 is what's known as the cyclooxygenase reaction. So, this is the, na the reaction after which uh, the whole enzyme is named. So, this is the cyclooxygenase reaction. Then the second conversion, the conversion of prostaglandin G2 into prostaglandin H2, this is what is known as the peroxidase reaction. Uh, prostaglandin H2, then after you've produced it, comes out of the cell membrane, okay, and goes into the cytoplasm of the cell, and it's going to make its way down to another enzyme, which is in the membrane of the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so we have an intracellular organelle, which is known as the endoplasmic reticulum, or ER for short, and uh, this is a very important organelle. It's where uh, much of protein synthesis occurs, okay, so proteins uh, are folded in the endoplasmic reticulum, okay. It's also the intracellular store of calcium, but in addition to that, in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, you have an enzyme which is called prostacyclin synthase, okay, so this is prostacyclin synthase, and basically, um, this enzyme is going to act on the prostaglandin H2 that comes to it, and it's going to convert it from prostaglandin H2 into prostacyclin, okay? And prostacyclin also has another name, okay? So the other name for prostacyclin is that it's also sometimes called prostaglandin I2, okay? Uh, and, of course, prostaglandin I2 would be abbreviated to uh, PGI2 for short. So PGI2 is the shorthand for prostacyclin. So often people will denote it as PGI2, but they'll call it prostacyclin. Now, once prostacyclin synthase has worked on the prostaglandin H2 and converted it into prostaglandin I2, then the prostaglandin I2 will then be secreted from the cell. Okay, so this will leave the cell and go into uh, the extracellular fluid. Now, basically, this will be happening in the endothelial cells of the terminal arterioles. Okay, so let me get my picture of um, the synovial membrane back again. Okay, so it will ha be happening in these endothelial cells of the terminal arterioles here and they will be producing prostaglandin I2. And the prostaglandin I2 will be diffusing backwards to the smooth muscle cells, and it will cause relaxation of those smooth muscle cells. And then when those relax, it means that the rings of vascular smooth muscle cells will dilatate, okay? And that means that the whole uh, terminal arteriole will dilatate, and this will produce vasodilatation. So prostacyclin is extremely important in leading to uh, vasodilatation, and therefore increasing blood flow to the site of inflammation. Okay, now, that's what happens in type 1 activation. What happens in type 2 activated endothelial cells? So, when interleukin 1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha 
act on their receptors on the surface of endothelial cells. They trigger type 2 activation, and basically the result of type 2 activation is that you increase the synthesis of prostacycline. So type 1 activation causes a bit of synthesis of prostacycline. Once you've undergone type 2 activation as well as type 1 activation, you get massive synthesis of prostacycline. Now how does it do this? Well basically, type 2 activated endothelial cells make a new enzyme. Okay, so they make a bigger, better cyclooxygenase enzyme. So let me put this here. So they make a massive, great new cyclooxygenase enzyme, which also implants itself into uh, the uh, plasma membrane. And this is called cyclooxygenase 2, COX-2. Now, there is a little bit of COX-2 constitutively expressed within the endothelial cells. However, there's not much of it. And once you've undergone type 2 activation, you massively upregulate the amount of cyclooxygenase 2 that you have within the cell membrane. Now, why is this so significant? Well, it's significant because cyclooxygenase 1 is a miserable little enzyme. Its ability to convert arachidonic acid into prostaglandin H2 is, you know, pretty pathetic, basically. It's very, very slow, and it doesn't do it very quickly at all, therefore. So, cyclooxygenase 2 is a bigger, better version, and it will be much, much quicker than cyclooxygenase 1. So, basically, you produce this arachidonic acid because of the type 1 activation. Initially, cyclooxygenase 1 works extremely slowly, converts a little bit of it into prostaglandin H2, and then that prostaglandin H2 can be converted into prostacycline, and then the prostacycline will be secreted, so you'll produce a little bit of prostacycline. But once you've undergone type 2 activation, COX-2 goes up in the, en um, in the endothelial cells, phospholipid bilayers, and it's now going to do the job properly. It's going to start churning out prostaglandin H2 from the arachidonic acid that you've liberated. And it's going to, therefore, provide a huge amount of substrate for the prostacycline synthase, and you'll therefore get more prostacycline being produced, and therefore more vasodilatation. Okay, so cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2. These are the main two forms of cyclooxygenase that we're going to be interested in. Okay, so, they are important for producing the vasodilatation of the terminal arterioles, which increases the blood flow uh, to the synovium, and that is extremely important for the acute inflammatory response, uh, because, remember, it's the blood that provides the inflammatory exudate, and the blood that provides the leukocytes, and if you don't increase your blood flow to the area, then your the amount of inflammatory exudate you're going to produce is going to be hugely reduced, and the amount of leukocytes you recruit is going to be hugely reduced. So you're going to hugely reduce the synovitis and hopefully the propagation of the rheumatoid arthritis. So these enzymes look like a fantastic target then. If we can knock them out, then we stop vasodilatation, or at least reduce it hugely, okay? And therefore we should hugely reduce synovitis and rheumatoid arthritis, therefore. So, this is what the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs do. They block these cyclooxygenase enzymes, and you can have non-selective uh, COX inhibitors, okay? Which uh, will block both cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2. Okay, now examples of non-selective cyclooxygenase inhibitors. Well, let's start off with the very famous ones. So we'll start off with aspirin. Okay, another example of a non-selective uh, cyclooxygenase inhibitor, ibuprofen. Okay. And then two more slightly less well-known, but still very famous drugs. Uh, indomethacin is another non-selective uh, COX inhibitor. Okay, and then very powerful non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. And then finally, another one, diclofenac. Okay, so these four drugs are my examples of non-selective cyclooxygenase inhibitors. And you know, if you Google this, you will be able to get a huge number of names of these drugs. These are the main four that I, that I know. Um, 
and they work by blocking both cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2. They therefore stop the conversion of arachidonic acid into prostaglandin H2 in the um, endothelial cells, and therefore you don't get prostacycline being produced, therefore you hugely reduce vasodilatation of the terminal arterioles, and therefore uh, the um, and therefore, um, rheumatoid arthritis is hugely reduced. Now, there is a problem with non-selective COX inhibitors, which is that cyclooxygenase 1 is also expressed in many other tissues other than just the endothelial cells. So, for instance, it's expressed within the stomach, okay? And um, there it's involved in regulating the production of stomach acid. So when you block it, you can get dysregulation of the production of stomach acid, and it can therefore cause quite nasty gastrointestinal um, problems, okay? So, there are also COX-2 selective uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, because after all, the main uh, cyclooxygenase enzyme, which actually converts arachidonic acid into prostaglandin H2 in these activated endothelial cells, is the COX-2 form of the enzyme, rather than COX-1. So it should still be effective if we just block COX-2. It won't be quite as effective as the non-selective ones, but it should still be very effective. Okay, so there are COX-2 selective um, inhibitors. Okay, and examples of these are a drug known as Celecoxib. Okay, this is still actually used. And then there's another drug known as Orofecoxib, which is no longer used. Now, the problem with COX-2 selective um, NZs are that they tend to have, well, they do have uh, an increased risk of myocardial infarction, so they cause uh, increased risk of, of having a heart attack. Okay, and this led to rofecoxib being withdrawn in 2004. Okay, but these other non uh, other COX inhibitors, these other NZs that we've discussed, can be used to treat um, rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, so we'll continue our discussion in the next uh, video, um, where we'll talk about uh, the anti-cytokine drugs.